All right, we'll get started now. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Healthy Yards webinar. Uh, and welcome to Planning a Sustainable Yard, What Works what, Where with Adele Pierre. Uh, I'm Becca Robinson, a landscape designer for Reap Green Solutions. And tonight's webinar is co-sponsored by us and the City of Kitchener. Uh, Reap Green Solutions is an environmental charity uh, serving Waterloo Region in Ontario, Canada, for those of you joining us from afar. Uh, we are an environmental charity that helps you live sustainably. You can feel free to check out our website, reapgreen.ca, to see the various programs and services we provide to help you live more sustainably, both inside your house and outside your house. We have a few more webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks if uh, you're interested in this topic and want to learn more. Beginning with tomorrow, um, common landscape mistakes to avoid for thriving trees. Uh, May 18th, we have designing your rain garden. Uh, that's a webinar I'll be, uh, I'll be giving on how to size, locate, and design a rain garden on a residential property. May 19th, ready, set, grow, which discusses how gardening can combat climate change, provide food, and boost biodiversity. And June 9th, options for permeable driveways, patios, and paths be a look at uh, what's suitable, what projects would be suitable to have a permeable um, option, uh, including budget implications and other planning factors you may want to consider. And for those of you who are living in the city of Kitchener, we'll be emailing you in the next week or so to announce the launch of a new program we're doing with the city called Rain Smart Neighborhoods, where we'll be providing um, a variety of consultation services to residents of the city of Kitchener who are interested in creating a Rain Smart yard. So that will include providing advice on rainwater harvesting, rain gardens, infiltration galleries, tree planting, permeable paving, and naturalized landscaping. Uh, some of the services we'll be offering include weekly virtual drop-in Q&A sessions. If you're planning on uh, doing a project and just need a, some advice from a healthy yards advisor or a landscape designer or an arborist, we'll be hosting uh, those online weekly. And we'll also be providing on-site landscape consultations for residents in certain neighborhoods that have been identified by the city uh, to participate in that program. So for those of you from Kitchener, stay tuned for that. All right. So tonight's uh, speaker is Adele Pierre. I'm looking for my notes. Adele is a landscape architect and ICA, ISA arborist. She leads an award-winning design firm specializing in the creation of beautiful low maintenance landscapes. Mindful of the effects of climate change on our natural systems, Adele incorporates native plantings in all projects to provide habitat for pollinators, build healthy soils and manage rainwater. We work with Adele at Reap Green Solutions on our backyard tree planting program and our rain garden rebate program for the city of Guelph. And I'm thrilled to have her here tonight. So over to you, Adele. Good evening. It's lovely to be here together with so many other enthusiastic gardeners. And I see there are people from all over the world. So welcome. Some of this will be specific to Ontario, but most of the principles that I will give you tonight will be useful wherever you are. When you're planning a sustainable yard or a sustainable garden, there are a lot of things to think about that are fundamental to gardening. I know along with a lot of other people, the first thing I want to talk about is plants. We love plants, they're beautiful, they make us feel good. But really, if we start with the plants, it's like planning a house by starting with the paint colors. We really need the foundation for a healthy garden and a healthy yard, and we need to think about the basic principles. So tonight I'm going to talk about things other than plants and things that will help you plan your yard to be more sustainable. There will be four parts. First of all, we're going to talk about knowing your soil, then managing your water, know where the water goes. Then we'll stop for some questions. Then the third part will be coming up with a plan for your yard. And the fourth part, planting trees, because trees are part of any plan of sustainability. No. Sustainability is a yes. Sorry, some folks are having trouble yeah. seeing you. Have you shared your screen yet? I did share my screen, but not me. Just a moment. Let me just do this. Again. Sorry, just there's some technical glitch. I think folks are saying that they just see okay. black. <laughs> okay, I think that's Let's working. Let's just try now. that. Again. There you 
good now? I can see it now, yes. Good. Great, thank you. Everyone's good? Okay, so sorry about that. So sustainable, sustainability is a real buzzword. Uh, you hear it apply to absolutely everything, but it certainly does apply to yards and gardens. There's a wonderful definition here that I found from somebody that wrote for Fine Gardening and talks about sustainable issues, talking about supporting, preserving, keeping things alive, maintaining reinforcement and nourishment. You just think about how we talk about food as being sustenance and that we just need to keep things going in a healthy direction. Practicing sustainable gardening is practicing good environmental stewardship. Everything that you put into your garden, whether it be a deck, whether it be a patio, a driveway or trees, you want to make sure that what you are doing is beneficial for the environment or does as little harm as possible. And if possible, reduces climate, um, reduces global heating, manages water properly. So the first thing I really want to talk about is preserving, managing and sustaining two of our most precious resources, water and soil. Now, soil and water are basic. Our, my two grandchildren were here last week mucking around, and the most fun they had was filling a wheelbarrow full of water and putting dirt in it and swishing it around and throwing, it, throwing in a few plants and calling it dandelion soup. Soil and water are basic to life. So let's just talk about soil first. Number one, if you are going to have a sustainable garden, if you are going to practice your gardening with any kind of intelligence, you need to know your soil. So we have here a little graphic, a picture on the one side that shows the actual soil layers, and then a little graphic that shows the different words, uh, the different, the names of the different layers of the soil. Some of these layers of soil you can alter, but many you can't. The bedrock is there. The weathered rock fragments are there. The subsoil is there. The topsoil, you can manage a fair bit, and the humus, certainly you can. Looking at this, I would say the most important thing for us to think about right now is that top layer where the humus is in the topsoil. To keep your soil healthy, you must make sure that it is always covered. So there is nothing more destructive to soil than having it exposed to the elements. You want to make sure that either you have a mulch on that soil or else that it is covered with plants. I am having difficulty with this and I'm not sure what the problem is. Here we go. This is a piece of land that has been stripped of topsoil. This is on my property. We built a house here 15 years ago and um, topsoil was stripped to be able to do construction and put in a septic tank, etc. Topsoil was put back on, but in some parts of the yard, the water ran down the hillside and took all the topsoil away with it. After 15 years, there is still nothing growing on this piece of property. If you lose your topsoil, you have lost life. You can put topsoil back on, but that's not the best use of resources. Make sure that your soil is always covered and always protected. One of the things that you need to know to plant sustainably is your soil texture. There are three basic kinds of soil and they are displayed here and they come from your bedrock. So there's not a lot you can do to alter that. Sand, silt, and clay. They all have their own characteristics. They're all, they all have their different strengths. Everybody knows what sand is like. It's, the grains are quite large. They're a little bit rounded. It's what you see at the beach. Um, sand has fabulous drainage. Water just goes through it right away, but also, 
the nutrients go right through it. It doesn't hang on to nutrition. So if you have a sandy soil, the water's going to flow through well, you'll get great drainage, you won't have flooding, but you also will have plants that are suffering from lack of nutrition. On the other end of the spectrum is clay. Clay is the smallest possible particles. They're like uh, 0 0.002 millimeters in size. They are flat in shape. And so you can see that this graphic there, what we call platy, they line up with plates. Clay soil has a hard time infiltrating water. But on the other hand, it has great nutrient retention. So if you've got clay soil, your plants, once they get in there, are going to be happy. Silt is right in the middle of those. Silt is what's left when a mud puddle dries up, that sort of talcum-like powder that's at the bottom. And silt, uh, it's okay for drainage, it's okay for retention, but it erodes like crazy. So if you have a silty soil, you need to make sure, doubly sure, that there are some plants holding that in place or you're going to lose it. Now, how do you discover what kind of soil you have? Well, there are a number of ways. For those of you who live in the Grand River Conservation Area, you can go online to a little program they have that's called Map My Property. You can punch in your address and there are all kinds of maps that come up and they'll tell you what your bedrock is. They'll tell you what your surface soil is, all kinds of great stuff. I, that's generally available anywhere in the world. It's not that hard to find out what you have. There's also a much more localized way of doing that. You get yourself a glass mason jar, you put in a scoop full of soil, you fill it with water, you shake it around, and you let it settle. And the first thing to settle out will be the sand. It's the heaviest, and it will be on the bottom, followed by the silt, followed by the clay. And you'll be able to see what your soil is, because no soil is really purely sand, silt, or clay. It's a combination of all of them. Now, whenever I look up what kind of soil a plant wants, and I look it up at a garden center, they always say the same thing. They say loam, beautiful loam, everything likes loam. Well, garden loam is about 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay. But that doesn't matter. You can deal with what you have. You can't change the texture but you can make some alterations. Soil pH is another thing that is given to you by mother nature and you would have a hard time changing. Your soil pH is very much dependent on what kind of bedrock you've got underneath you and good luck fighting that. So you can see on the one side, if you've got a limestone bedrock like we do here on the Niagara Escarpment, your soil is going to be alkaline. If you have a granite bedrock, like up on the Canadian Shield, generally your soil is going to be acidic. There's a good reason why cranberries grow up north and they don't grow here. There's a good reason why rhododendrons thrive in Victoria and Vancouver, BC, and they just poop right out in my garden bed. If you try to plant plants that like an acidic soil, and you have an alkaline soil, you're asking for trouble, it's going to be constant triage. And if your plants are unhappy and you have to sustain them like that all the time, it's a waste of time. Mother Nature will always win out. You can try to change the acidity, you can try to change the alkalinity, but you're going to, the soil is going to revert to what it will naturally be in that situation. Now, there is one thing that you can definitely change and you should change, and that is the soil structure. And the soil structure is how the individual particles are arranged in clumps or aggregates. We call a good soil structure friable. How's that for a weird word? F-R-I-A-B-L-E. It means it breaks apart easily. Soil structure can be improved. I'm going to take you on a little tour of my soil. So I live on what's called the Haldeman Clay Plain, and that's what it is. It's solid clay. One of my neighbors jo jokes that it is, you can cultivate it for about two weeks of the year, and that's about right now, because after that, it turns into cement. So this is actually topsoil in one of my garden beds. 
But as you can see, it's pretty stiff. You can see it's shiny from where the spade came down there. There's nothing too friable about that. Things do grow in that garden, but it's not a great soil structure. If I try to mess around with it with my hand, it just becomes more solid. This is great soil for making bricks. You can see those tiny little earthworms in there. It's not a great soil structure. The roots have a hard time getting through. The air pores are very small and the water has a hard time getting in. This is the topsoil about 20 feet away in a garden bed that I have amended with compost. Compost is magic. It doesn't matter whether it's horse, sheep, goat, chicken manure, straw, grass clippings, leaf mold, it doesn't matter. If it's organic matter and it's broken down and it's in the top layer of your soil, you're going to have a lot more success. And when I try to break that up, that's what we call friable soil, a huge difference from the previous picture. And I can tell you that the plants in this garden bed are much happier. So first of all, know your soils. The second thing to have a sustainable garden is that you need to know where the water goes. Water and soil work together. Before we just go on with water, I'm just going to show you this little graphic. You should know about this, that soil is made up of soil particles of air pores and of water. So if you take a look at this first graphic, this is called unsaturated soil. There's groundwater just about everywhere, depending on where you live, it will be higher or lower. In this instance, there's a lot of air space between the, uh, the soil granules. When the rain comes down, there's a lot of places for it to go. This is a saturated soil. It means those pores are filled up about as much as they can possibly be. And we need to hope that that's going to drain out because most plants can't survive if the water is saturated all the time. They will just out and out drown, except for a few plants that are well adapted for that kind of soil. When we get water on the surface, that's called flooding. And that's where we start to run into difficulties. And this is why we need to know how to manage water. So I'm a landscape architect and I spend a lot of time dealing with grading and drainage. It sounds dull, but it's incredibly important. And there's only a couple of things that you need to know and they're very basic. Number one, water runs downhill. Number two, water takes the quickest route possible downhill. And number three, water causes erosion. So you remember that picture I showed you of my property where there was no topsoil. It's all gone. Nothing's going to grow there unless I bring in a load of topsoil like six to eight inches and hope for the best. Now, we have managed very badly protecting our water or just plain managing our water. Historically, in every part of the world, the plan has been to channel the water and get rid of it as quickly as possible. This is Black Creek in Toronto, and this poor stream slash river has just been completely contained in concrete. And as a result, we get stuff like this. Don Valley Expressway flooded. It happens over and over and over because we don't treat our water properly. In terms of homeowners, what we often do is we get the stuff into the storm drains, we get the stuff coming off the roof, into the drain pipe, we direct that drain pipe over the driveway, it goes into the storm sewers, all of them flood, we get a combined sewer overflow in our lakes and streams. It's just, it's a total and complete mess. And so it's very important for us as homeowners to be able to figure out how to manage that water properly. 
this is a very elementary graphic, but there is a huge element of truth in it. There are three ways of managing the water. And I hate to say manage it because it's our most valuable resource. I mean, when they go to Mars, what are they looking for? Water, because they know that maybe there's a possibility of life. But to get the water back into the ground where it belongs, not into the roads, not into the storm sewers, not flooding the freeways, we need to soak it up somehow, we need to spread it out somehow, and we need to slow it down. So when you are looking at your yard in terms of sustainability, take a look out there when it's pouring down rain. Take a look at where the water goes. Where is it running fast? How could you slow that down? Is there a possibility that you could regrade to spread things out a little bit? Could you soak it up in some way with a rain garden or an infiltration trench? I remember the defining moment for me, and this is when I decided to actually go back to school and become a landscape architect. I had designed a garden for somebody in a new subdivision. They were beautiful condominiums. The soil was clay. The contractor had scraped all of the topsoil off built the houses, compacted the soil like mad, put a thin scraping of topsoil back on, and then slapped salt on top. We put a garden in. It was absolutely beautiful. My client called up and she said, Adele, my plants are all dying. And I said, well, have you been watering? And she said, I think they're drowning. And so I went to her place during a rainfall. And this was a large condominium, so it was probably 2,500 square feet of roof space. The water was literally pouring out, gushing out of the drain pipes into the yard, going every which way, collecting randomly. And this was happening on the entire subdivision. And sure enough, the plants were drowning, but that wasn't the worst of it. They were all trying to get rid of the water, but the worst of it was, on every single one of those condominiums, they had a watering system that was using city potable water to water the plants. And I thought, this is insanity. On one hand, we're trying to get rid of the water, and then we're putting treated, fluoridated, whatever water on top of our plants. This can't be right. So if you've got a yard that looks like this, or a section that looks like this. Maybe you need something like this. The first step in looking at your sustainable yard is, where is that water going? The greatest amount of water is coming out of your downspouts. Without doubt, it is coming out of your downspouts. If you can possibly manage in your design to direct that downspout into a rain garden, you will be doing a world of good. You will be protecting the water. You will have a wonderful garden with gorgeous plants in it. And it doesn't have to be big, it can be small. There is an infinite amount of information available. This little graphic came from the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. They have a an entire section on building rain gardens. You can talk to Rebecca, who did the introduction. She knows an incredible amount of, about rain gardens. Almost every conservation authority and many cities in the world and all environmental charities have information on rain gardens. They are so powerful. So what is it? It's basically a depression in the ground. So this is a very simplistic one and it's very gentle. But you can see the water is going to come out of the building downspout and it's going to go into this bowl that you've dug out in the ground. Now, the special feature of this bowl is that the soil at the bottom is quite permeable. So we get the flooding, as we saw in that one graphic about the water coming down and the water levels, but the soil is permeable enough that it is going to disappear within 24 hours. 
What does a rain garden look like? Well, what kind of taste do you have? So just take a look at a few of these and see if this might be something that you could manage in your yard. This is a rain garden that was built in Guelph two years ago, and it manages two separate downspouts. This is during and well, after a heavy raid, but it's still kind of coming down. This was an interesting rain garden because it wasn't built deep. It was built big and shallow and it collects a lot of water. It's at a very sophisticated looking property and it's a beautiful rain garden. There you can see the other outlet for the water. And within, I'd say less than a day, all of that rain will have disappeared, but we'll still have these beautiful plants that are sucking up all of the moisture and just enjoying it so much. This is what I call my cheap and cheerful rain garden. I love this one. The people who did this were so enthusiastic and she obviously loves flowers and daisies. It's tiny, but it didn't need to be big. It's collecting water from a drain pipe that's going underneath the deck right here. So they managed to hide it under the deck and then the water comes through these boulders here and into this rain garden. This one's actually a heart shape. You can't see it from here. And it's quite deep. So completely different style from the one before. You would probably have room in your yard for something of this size. Here's another one. This one's much more minimalist and, and quite elegant. And this, uh, this started with a garden bed that was a long the front of the house. It was one of those standard gardens, you know, where everything's just sort of crammed up against the house and the edges of the property. And so this garden was just expanded in size and the rain garden put in. And again, a downspout is leading into this rain garden. So the homeowner wanted this look, which is a dry river bed. It looks very nice. It looks very clean. It serves a double purpose. It slows down the water as it's going through the rain garden and it also looks fantastic. Now, if you only had that gravel, we would call that something different. So that is, this is now a type of infiltration trench. And you would have seen all these things listed when Rebecca was talking about the seminars coming up and you'll get much more detail from them on this. This was a garden of a client of mine. These, these are, many of them are. Um, she had, she was very enthusiastic. Big, big, big property in Oakville. She ripped out all of the lawn, front and backyard, and, and put in plants. But this particular area of the yard was the lowest line. It was heavy, heavy clay soil, and it always had flooding. And so, she, again, she directed her rain spout into this infiltration trench. This is just straight boulders. That's all it is. Gravels and boulders. We actually planted some plants in here. They're doing just fine. The water travels down this route and goes to the end. And there's kind of a basin there that it sits in and collects the water and then it disappears. But if you had a woodland type of garden, this would be absolutely beautiful. I mean, look at those ferns. It's, it's um, wonderful way of managing water on site. I do what I call faux rain gardens, fake ones. Now, you obviously don't have this kind of scale, but this just kind of illustrated it well. This is a church, obviously. Um, this was a section of the property that was just, for want of a better term, garbage. The soil was completely compacted. There was lawn, sort of, but it was mostly growing moss because there was no fertility. There was very little light. Um, the church decided to put an accessibility ramp. So this was a great opportunity to just redo the whole thing. So this is an instance where I literally did bring in a lot of topsoil. There's a wonderful product called manured loam. It has quite a smell to it. But it, uh, it did the job and it was planted up. And here's just a small section of it now. So technically it's not a rain garden because there isn't a depression. It's on a slope, but a lot of these plants absorb rainwater extremely well. We have some cedars, we have some viburnums, there's some service berries in there that you can't see, witch hazel, 
uh, dogwood. There's even juniper that does okay because the water's going down the slope. This patch of land that was completely barren is now full of color, full of life, full of birds, full of bugs, full of all kinds of wonderful things. It's just life-giving. And the people in the neighborhood walk through this garden every day. They just say, what a gift. It's amazing what you can do. This is another one that's sort of a rain garden, but not really. And this is something to think about if you have a big driveway. This is a Beaux-Arts house. It is a Beaux-Arts house, as you can tell, or Art Deco. And it has a big circular driveway. The circular driveway is graded towards the center. The center section here was a very nondescript patch of grass. It did absolutely nothing. We wanted a much more formal look for this property. And so we put in plants. A lot of those are native plants, believe it or not, but it's a very formal style. And all of the rainwater from the driveway and the circular driveway, all of these sections, goes into this central portion and feeds these plants. This one actually won an environmental award in Kitchener a couple of years ago. It looks uh, very controlled and very contained, but that's only because it was just planted. By the middle of the summer, it's a riot of color. And those plants, again, are supporting all kinds of bees, butterflies, bugs, you name it. It's a wonderful garden and full of life and full of vigor and managing water beautifully. Otherwise, all of that water from the driveway is going into the storm sewers. Permeable paving is something that's relatively new. Um, unless you think about gravel driveways, those are permeable. Uh, but People are curious about them. And so I thought I'd just do a little section on them because a driveway or a walkway or a patio, same thing, is a huge part of any living space. And they can be made much more permeable. If you pour concrete, the water's not going into the ground. If you do a permeable driveway or a permeable surface, it is the water is being infiltrated in. So here is a cross section. You can see these are our pavers. Here we have the two inch bedding course, which is a sand or high performance bedding, something like that, it's standard. Below that, there would be a crushed course um, for any installation. So here in Canada, four to six inches under pedestrian application, eight to 10 inches of this granular material under vehicular. The difference is this right here. So you remember me talking about infiltration trenches. This is a massive infiltration trench underneath the driveway. So by the time the water goes through the cracks, through sand, and we all know that sand cleans because you know it's put in every septic system to clean out impurities, then the gravel, then the rock, and into the soil, that sand is, that water is beautifully cleaned and it's going right back into the subsoil, back into the surface of where it belongs, it, right into the groundwater. I'll show you a couple of applications because again, just as with the rain gardens, there are many, many, many styles. Now, just be aware, if you're going to do the right thing and put this material in, it costs a little bit more. And I, Becca talked about that, you know, that that will be discussed in that webinar because you have to excavate more and you have to add more granular material. Granular material. Now this, this is a permeable driveway. It's on a slope. <clears throat> None of the water manages to get to the end of the slope. It's all absorbed into the driveway by the time it gets to the bottom. It looks like a standard brick driveway. So this is a product, I don't know whether it's by Unilock or Permacon or whatever, it doesn't matter, they all have products like this. 
You can see that the spaces between the bricks are just a little bigger than normal. That's where the water goes in. Very, very traditional look. This is one of my favorites because this was an interesting project. This house is backed by a hill that is, I would say, 25 feet tall. So water pours down that slope across their backyard, down the sidewalks, into the driveway, and out. You can see that they actually have two catch basins, one right in the driveway, which is collecting everything from up top, and one at the base of the driveway. We wanted to do a permeable application here to help mitigate some of that flooding. This application is actually meant for grass. And grass would look great in those blocks, but if you put grass in there, number one, you probably have to put some fertilizer in. Number two, you'd probably have to mow it. Number three, who's kidding who? Once the temperature goes up to 35 degrees in Ontario, that grass is frying because it's in those concrete pavers. So that might work in a more moderate climate where there's a lot of rain, but here it would not look good. Whereas with the gravel, you can specify your granular mix. So these people really loved granite. They have granite slabs inside of the house. They have granite on the porch. And so they just filled all of this with granite. I think it's an absolutely fabulous application. The other bonus of this, this uh, application is that in the winter, because of the gravel, I'm not sure what the science is about this, but it's never slippery, it's never icy. The sun shines down on that and all of a sudden the ice disappears. It's a fabulous application. Now this is a nightmare. This is a little house in Toronto, it happens to belong to my son and daughter-in-law. And I grinned when I saw it and said, that's great, it's great inside. But the whole street is like this covered in concrete, hardly any trees at all. The special treat with this one is that we've got this asphalt driveway directing the water right down into the house. It's now against the law to build these what we call reverse grade driveways. You can't do that anymore. But we did manage to come up with a solution here. It took a little bit of engineering. So this was all filled in, but before we filled it in, the contractor wanted to just leave the asphalt and fill it in. Well, you can imagine when it rained, we just have a bathtub. So the asphalt was broken up. The whole thing was filled with granular material, in other words, gravel. So now we've got a great big, huge infiltration trench. And this is what we did. We did some driving strips. Now this was put in, this picture was taken immediately after installation. So the product that we used in the strip in the middle is actually a green roof application. They're sedum mats because we just had a short amount of soil, just like you would on a green roof. And underneath is drainage. The pavers are small. There's lots of joints in there, lots of places for the water to go through. And all of a sudden, we've got a healthy driveway instead of something that was creating um, stormwater problems all the time. Now take a look at where that collection bin is. These are very resourceful young people and they built a bin to hold all of their uh, recycling and put a green roof on top. So even in a little, little, tiny, tiny garden like this, we managed to green it up and put in some plants. This is another application and it's called Eco Raster, but there are a number of other products just like it. There's a grid there. Um, made of a heavy plastic, I believe Han Plastics also has one, and you can fill it with whatever kind of gravel you want, similar to the permeal driveway that I showed you. This is a very rustic application. This was done in an industrial area of Hamilton, but just so you know, the Aga Khan Museum 
in Toronto has used this product because uh, they had originally put down gravel paths. There were accessibility issues for people with walkers and wheelchairs. And once they put this product down, it was no problem. It was all fixed. There are a number of other applications coming out. Permeable asphalt, permeable concrete. This is one that is being developed by those smart engineers at the University of Waterloo. I think it's called Porous Pave. It looks like asphalt. I just received three samples today. Don't those look like granola bars? But what they are, are uh, bits of recycled tires. So they're just taking tires, grinding them up, putting them together. And as you can see, there's a lot of pore space there. So the water just goes right through it. So your biggest piece of real estate, i.e. driveway, walkways, patios, can contribute to your sustainability by managing all of the water beautifully and returning it to the soil. Now, do we have any questions before I go on? I have been answering some of the questions in the, like by typing them, Adele, when they're to do with uh, something I'm more familiar with, but there's a few for you here. Um, I'll start reading the first one here. I've been attempting to amend my soil as when I grow anything, whether vegetables or flowers, they don't thrive. Root vegetables don't fill out. Flowers grow only enough to flower half the size. I've tried mulching with leaves and adding better quality soil with very little change. Main soil is clay on Southern exposure. So I guess to maybe generalize that for the rest of the audience, how would you approach that sort of problem for, for a gardener? So unsuccessful plant growth and maybe uh, poor quality soil. Yes, it sounds like a, it sounds like a fertility problem. So um, sometimes just adding manure and compost isn't quite enough. My strategy for that would be, first of all, to get a soil sample and take it to a testing lab. And they will tell you if there are any um, essential nutrients lacking. I know sometimes on clay soils, the phosphorus is incredibly high and it blocks other things. Um, uh, so that could be an issue. But if you are, have tried everything and you are still frustrated, I would say, Take that soil sample. Um, you can check with your local agricultural extension. Depending on where you live, I know the University of Guelph has soil samples, but you can even just look it up online, soil testing, and they will tell you what to do. Usually you have to take a couple of spots, different spots in the garden, you mix them together, you send a very small sample, but that would be my advice to you. Sometimes there's just something lacking. There's either too much of something or not enough of something. Great. Um, a couple more questions about your son's house. I saw you took out the bushes at your son's place and put smaller plants in instead. Are they more sustainable? No, he hated the privet. <laughs> so, you are, <laughs> so you are always making these choices and we'll get into that in the next bit as well. Um, I was loath to take it out because it's a lot of biomass. Now, what you didn't see is that a lot of those plants were smaller. There were some bigger ones that went in. There was a cedar. There are some taller grasses. Um, uh, they just wanted more color. They wanted more color, something a little bit more interesting. So that's why those were taken out. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll give you one more and then maybe we'll keep going. Um, how deep does gravel need to be in a driveway to keep out weeds? Uh, gravel will, you will never keep weeds out of gravel. <laughs> End of discussion. So what happens, everybody wants gravel. It looks so great. You see those French gardens and the California gardens. What happens is that the soil blows in from above and the weed seeds blow in from above. And those little rocks just provide enough shade and then you get a little bit of water. It's a wonderful, uh, germination situation. You will never keep weeds out of gravel. So you have to be di diligent. Now, I just had my uh, gravel driver, which is 300 feet long, resurfaced, or not resurfaced, dug up and regraded, and it looks great. But of course, the weeds are coming through. So I have different strategies. 
I have one of those blasters, you know, it's like a torch, just go out there and do that. You can use boiling water, you can use vinegar, but you will never, ever, ever keep weeds out of gravel because it comes in from above as well as below. Sorry. <laughs> And that's why the other issues are, are more popular, the other, uh, the other methods. So we have a few more questions. Do you want to keep going and I'll say organize these for the end? Sure, why not? <clears throat> so next we're going to talk about just coming up with a plan. And I'm going to show you a few plans because, you know, every property is different and something just might Wait with you. First of all, you need to know what the physical requirements are. And this is where you need to make those issues. Remember I said he hated the privet hedge that was coming out. So maybe you want to be really conscious of how much impermeable surface you have. So you think, okay, I'm just going to make my driveway a little narrower than they say, I'm sure it will be fine. It won't. Don't do anything that is going to aggravate everybody else, okay? So if you've got a driveway and you got one car, 12 feet wide. If you've got two cars, 24 feet wide, or you're going to have this situation that I have in the picture and you know that happens. Walkways, four feet. Four feet is comfortable for two people to walk side by side. Five feet, very generous. Six, seven feet, do you really need it that big? Maybe with a grandiose house, you need it for the scale. But that's when you can start to think, okay, how wide is comfortable and how much is too much? Your dining area, how many people are you going to have? What size table do you have? Measure it out. Put it on a graph. How many chairs do you have? Are they little chairs or are they the honking big comfortable ones? How much space is it going to have? Make sure you've got enough room, like three feet, for people to just go back and, and uh, ease back from the table. You don't want anybody to feel cramped. Lounging around a pool. Pools are big time uh, right now. They're so popular that the pool companies are saying, we're not booking till 2022. Do you have to have concrete around it? Is it absolutely essential that your sun lounger is absolutely level all the time? Can you put grass around it? Is that acceptable? There are all kinds of trade-offs. When you're looking at the garden beds and trees, how much room do you actually have? How much are you actually going to take care of? Whatever you do, make sure that what you plan is manageable make sure it's manageable. I'm going to show you a couple of garden designs that I consider to be sustainable. Um, I do this to my clients, whether or, not, <laughs> whether or not they want it, they're going to get it. So this was, I just have uh, the plan of this one and, and just the graphic of the plan. This was a, a house with a standard back subdivision backyard, very generous in size. Um, and it, what, there was a deck and there was a crappy lawn and there was a lot of flooding and there were two trees and that was it. And they didn't want to do a lot of maintenance. Well, what we did was first of all, paid attention to the drain pipe here. There was only one in the back. And so dug out the area that used to be lawn, put in a nice little infiltration trench there filled with gravel, put plants all around it that really like to suck up moisture. It's a lovely spot. We, this is a blended family, four kids, sometimes four kids there, sometimes none. So we put stairs all around the deck so the kids can run around. So you see there's lots of room to run around. We had a little uh, herb garden here with a bird feeder in it. You could go sit under the swing here and the lawn is reduced to a minimum amount of size and all of this space is now trees and shrubs. What that did, besides making the garden more beautiful and more interesting, was it, it um, alleviated all of the flooding problems on this property. Just a very small amount of lawn and everywhere where there was flooding, now we have plants just sucking up the moisture. Very successful. One of the best things you can do for sustainability, and this is going back to the privet hedge, 
more biomass, bigger plant beds, means more carbon being sucked up, more water being managed. Grass doesn't actually absorb water that well. This is a house uh, that had a lawn and two Norway maples. And for those of you who live in Ontario, Norway maples, as you know, are now considered invasive. They suck the life out of every lawn that they're in. So the lawn looked crappy. The, it, it just this was not a very interesting property. And we had a massive two-car driveway as well. So we call this one losing the lawn. We kept the driveway because they didn't want to change that and planted everything up. This is just after it was planted. Um, very tough customers near the front. I didn't even worry about native plants here. Just whatever would survive hostas and use did the trick at the front. We had more native plants farther back. And within two years, this whole garden was thriving. And what a difference from what it was before. I considered this one to be a highly sustainable landscape. This is another lovely little landscape that was on a corner lot. Well, this doesn't look lovely, but I just wanted to show you this picture of what we had before we started. The lawn was ripped out of everywhere, along this corner lot, along the side, along here, along the fright front. The woman said, I want this gone. This was a very interesting project because the couple, when the couple got married, they asked people to buy a plant for their landscape design. So that was really interesting. So this garden was installed uh, a year ago, just uh, last June. And it was promptly followed by an incredibly hot and dry summer. But in spite of that hot and dry summer, look at how this stuff is thriving. Now, this is very interesting to me. Uh, this was an experiment. I'm always experimenting. One of the difficulties I have with losing the lawn is very often the soil just spills over onto the uh, sidewalk. And I was worried about this in this application, especially as it's mulched. But if you plant grasses, they hold the soil like nobody's business. Now, isn't that a huge improvement over that? So again, a lot of biomass, a lot of biodiversity stuff just starting to plant here. Um, now, unfortunately, the landscapers didn't quite follow the plan. And do you remember I said, you need to know where your water goes. Well, they put these little yellow plants, this carex everywhere. And I looked at those and I said, those will die because they need constant water. And this is a Southwestern exposure. And sure enough, they all died, but we're just replanting. You can do a sustainable garden at any scale. This is at a big conference center over the septic system next to a gravel quarry, which means it's all gravel and it's all dry. And we've used native plants here. You can see some echinacea and you can see some switchgrass and it's huge, hundreds, hundreds of square feet. I used basically the same planting plan on this tiny little lot in downtown Toronto. I think it's tops 40 square feet if that but the plants are thriving and as you can see the amount of biomass has expanded greatly over when they just had grass so it's it's an amazing thing to do use what's already there reduce reuse recycle same applies to sustainability so the property that had that uh interesting driveway with the concrete blocks filled with gravel. When they were doing their renovation, they dug up two huge rocks and the homeowner was very upset. She said, what are we going to do with these? It's going to cost a fortune to get rid of them. How can we get rid of them? They weigh a ton. Well, her builder was very clever. And there are the two rocks. One of them has the address and the other one, they drilled a hole in the top and it's turned into a beautiful water feature. Another client, has this interlocking driveway that is in very, very poor condition. And she was going to replace it with concrete, but my contractor, Dave from Rockcrest Landscape, came along and said, I can fix it up. And here's an example of just what he did, just a little corner of a walkway. That interlock can be cleaned up and relayed with new jointing, new sand, 
you don't necessarily have to get rid of what you've got. Concrete's very enduring. So rather than ripping stuff out, ripping out all of the base material, putting in new base material, putting in a new product, it's so much more sustainable if you can use what you already have. I'm going to go very quickly through this last thing because as everybody knows, the best thing that you can do to, to mitigate climate change and to provide habitat is to plant a tree. Absolutely 100%. Trees moderate temperatures. Look at that heat map. That was taken with a, um, uh, a camera that tells you what temperature things are, 20 degrees difference between the concrete and the trees. I, sh I don't know how many times I've showed this slide, but it's a lot of times when emerald ash borer happened, somebody had the good idea of seeing if there was a correlation between that and respiratory disease, and there was. And every municipality knows that respiratory diseases and heart diseases are higher in the poorer neighborhoods where they have less tree cover. Trees provide habitat. We have service berries on our property, we never get one because the cedar wax wings take them all and they're welcome to it. If you're going to plant a tree for habitat, plant an oak, it supports over 400 species. Absolutely unbelievable. Trees provide stormwater management. There is a tree with its own little bioswale. All of this water is being directed into there, not into the storm drains, and that tree is just eating it up. If you have a damp spot on your property, plant a birch. It'll be very, very happy. There are limiting factors in choosing a tree. The sun or the shade, the soil texture, remember that. Remember the soil pH, whether it's wet or dry. Number one is size. If you don't remember to check the size, that is what hydro is going to do to your tree. No joke. So every municipality and every hydro in the world will have a drawing like this. If you are under power lines, and this is especially for your front yards, of course, and you know it's going to be one side of the street, not necessarily the other, make sure that you plant trees that are small enough to stay under the wires. We have some drop dead gorgeous small trees native to Canada, the red bud, the pagoda dogwood, the service berry. This service berry, this picture was taken by a client of mine. She was going to have this little shrub chopped down because it had never been pruned. She just took the top off it, gave it a butch cut every couple of years and it looked terrible. I said, no, get an arborist to do a good job of pruning pruning it and look at it, it's like a standout now. Another one, I'm on a personal campaign to get people to plant this hop hornbeam, gorgeous tree. Plant a minimum of 20 feet from existing trees. I'm not gonna talk about this because we ran out of time. Plant a minimum of seven feet from hard surfaces. Keep trees away from your interlock, keep it away from your driveways, keep it away from your walkways, and your patios, they will destroy them. Make sure you've got enough distance. And please stay away from the property lines. If you're planting a tree, don't go near your fence. The half of the tree that goes over the fence, your neighbor is within their legal rights to chop all of that off. And as you can see, this is an actual picture I took on site. Trees will eat fences. It's not good for either of them. If you don't know what tree to plant, if you're in Ontario, you can find the Ontario Tree Atlas online. You can click on your region. You can click on the variety. They will tell you exactly what the habitat is. I haven't talked about native versus non-native. I haven't talked a lot about plants, but I will say if you're planting a tree, plant a native tree. Trees are big. They're here for a long time. They provide a lot of habitat. They provide a lot of food. Try to plant a tree that is native to your region. Plan it and plant it now, because the biggest legacy you can have in terms of sustainability, besides taking care of your soil and managing your water, is planting a tree or trees, lots of them. Thanks. Sorry, I'm right on the wire. I don't know if you want to do questions or you want to wrap up now, Becca. Well, let's do questions if you're good with that. And then those folks who can't stay, welcome to leave. Thanks for coming. 
So we've got a lot of kind of very specific questions. I want to try to pick out the more generalist ones that will be applicable to more people. Um, how do you address uh, the problem of debris? So ideas for reuse of leaves, tree droppings, mulch blowing, et cetera, in a project or in a yard. In a yard, it, if you have room for a compost, that's, that's the thing to do. Um, any organic matter can be broken down into compost. There are many ways of dealing with it. So if you have a green bin and your municipality recycles it, you put it in the green bin because that's being turned into compost for somebody. If you have a compost bin, that's fine. You layer it. I mean, you can look this up, but you can layer the brown stuff like the leaves with the green stuff, which would be like grass clippings or with kitchen waste. If you really don't have room, what I have done when I was on a property with a lot of large trees, I just collected the leaves. I put them in garbage bags put a shovel full of dirt in the garbage bag, left the top kind of open and just let it sit all winter. And by the time the spring came, I, there was amazing leaf mold or, or compost in there. So I use everything. Because I'm on a big property, I'll even leave perennial weeds on the ground to dry up and turn into organic matter. So unless it's garbage, it can be reused. Hmm. Great. Um, how does porous pave, and for that matter, any of the other products you uh, mentioned tonight for permeable paving, stand up to winter salting? Can you use salt on the driveway? Yes. So the permeable pavements that I showed you are um, all made of concrete, and so that's fine. There is, you bring up a good issue because salt goes into the groundwater which is not great, okay? So as much as possible, one should try to avoid using salt. There are some other products or use as little salt as possible. Um, the one thing that I did talk about with permeable pavers and those joints in between the individual blocks sometimes collect garbage. They'll co collect silt or grit and they'll get clogged. So it um, affects the permeability of the water. There are companies that will come around and basically just vacuum them out. So there is some maintenance involved that needs to be done probably every couple of years. It depends on how much your driveway is used, um, but they definitely are not totally maintenance free. They need to be vacuumed out. So there is a price to pay on all levels. Again, you're always balancing. For those of you who live in the um, Grand, River, Grand River Conservation Area, as Adele mentioned, on that map feature, there's also markings that show uh, source water protection areas where those salting issues are more heightened because of the um, shallow distance between your driveway and the water table. So something else to consider if you're thinking about a permeable driveway. Um, okay. That's bad. How do you incorporate rain barrels for non-freezing times of the year? And can you still do a rain garden for the rest of the year? Okay, so rain barrels need to be emptied for the winter. End of discussion. Right, Becca? Yes. Yes, they have yep. to be emptied. Um, rain gardens, um, as long as your downspout is not blocked by anything, you'll be fine. You're going to run into issues if your downspout is blocked because then the water backs up. Now, this is interesting because uh, another type of rain garden is called a bioswale. And a lot of research has been done on bioswales. So it's more commercial application, whether or not they work in the winter. And they did a study at the city of Calgary. And let me tell you, I grew up there, it's cold. And those bioswales slash rain gardens still function well in the winter. So it's an amazing thing. I think I've got one last question here. Um, I'm going to try to paraphrase this a bit. Could you tell us a little more about how you can combine infiltration trenches and walkways? So if someone's asking if they can dig a trench under a flagstone walkway, what type of um, materials might they need? 
Um, you actually you can. And that property where, again, where I showed you that those, those pavers filled with gravel, we did that very thing along the side and I've done the same thing on another property. And so <clears throat> what we did was we did a big bed of gravel underneath. So it would be um, probably a foot deep. It doesn't even, it doesn't have to be that deep. Then we put a more decorative stone on top. So you can use river rock or whatever you like. And then you don't actually lay a flagstone pathway, you get square concrete slabs. And you can get ones that look great. They need to be about two inches thick and you place them on top and you put them far enough apart that it's not uncomfortable to step from one to the other. So that's going to depend on how big your pavers are. So there's usually about, I don't know, three or four inches between them, but it works extraordinarily well. And it works extremely well between houses where there isn't a lot of space and uh, not, not a lot of places for the water to go. So yes, it works. And I've done it on quite a number of occasions. Great, we've got one last question that just popped in here. Do you have experience shoveling permeable driveways with open pavers? filled with gravel? No, I don't. Okay. But I have not had any complaints from that client. So that one filled with gravel is the only one I've done to date. Most of them are permeable, like the one that looked like brick. Um, and it's no different than shoveling any other driveway. So the pavers are engineered so that they lie flush. So uh, shoveling is not an issue. Great. I would think with the gravel filled one, the gravel's below the surface of the block, so it should be okay. Yeah, yeah I imagine that too. All right, I think that's all the questions. Um, on behalf of REAP Green Solutions and City of Kitchener, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. And thanks Adele for your great presentation. It's very inspiring. Um, great. And hopefully we'll see you all at a future webinar. Have a good night, everybody.